Welcome to the meeting this week of the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. Our theme for our club is innovation, entrepreneurship, and education. And as a part of our club, we use technology to its full advantage. This meeting is a special meeting in that uh, one of our charter members, Keith Marsh, is uh, being the speaker. Now, Keith has done something which he is going to tell us about in a few minutes, which is, I hope, to be a motivating uh, exercise for every person who watches this video. Because what Keith has done, you could do. And in that respect, this is what, what Keith has also done is what Rotary is all about. And that is getting your hands a little bit dirty and uh, getting in the trenches and participating on an international project. And I'm going to let Keith now tell you all about it. Take it away, Keith. Thank you, Roger. Uh, I guess I, I share now, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Okay. Okay, can you see my screen? No problem. Okay, good. Well, I'm so happy to be here and tell you about my recent uh, trip to Africa. It was a uh, rotary uh, project for uh, uh, water uh, purification. Uh, it's the second one I've, I've been on with this group. Um, and I've also been on several other international uh, rotary service tr uh, trips around the, around the world. Uh, but this was uh, one of the most interesting. And um, this, uh, this, this to Africa included uh, three venues, which you can see there on the, on the bottom of the screen. Um, the first was the, the water project part of it, part of the trip. And then uh, we also went to Tanzania uh, for a cultural festival and uh, then to um, back to Kenya for a uh, safari uh, portion of the trip. So uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Kenya and Tanzania are considered in East Africa. Uh, you've got Ethiopia to the north. Um, you've got the uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo to the, to the west, and Uganda, and then Mozambique in the south. Um, it's just below the uh, the equator, so that the temperature is fairly, uh, you know, mild. Uh, technically, this is their their winter, but it's uh, it was a very pleasant uh, time of the year to go. Uh, and this trip is, was with H two Open Doors, which is a Rotary project um, out of um, out of a club in the on the peninsula. John Kaufman started this program several years ago, and I've uh, been involved in it on a couple of occasions. Uh, but when this trip came up, I, uh, I thought I just had to go. So more specifically, within Kenya and Tanzania, the three stars there show the locations that we visited. Uh, on the right is Lamu, which is an island just, on the co just off the coast of uh, Kenya. And then um, the Saba Fest, which was a cultural festival in uh, Tanzania, south of uh, Lake Victoria. And then finally, uh, a little fun with uh, the, the um, safari at the uh, Maasai Mara Reserve in, uh, in Kenya. So this is our group. Uh, there were 18 of us. Uh, I think there were 12 from the Bay Area, a few from uh, San Diego and other places around the country. And I think about half, a little less than half of us were Rotarians. Uh, the others were either spouses or or friends of um, of different different people in the in the group, but it was a, a good group, well diverse. We got along great with each other, and uh, had a good time. Um, so the first part of our trip, uh, the the uh, water installation part of the trip, was on the island of Lamu, which is on the coast of of Kenya. And to get there, you have to fly into an airstrip on another island, uh, Manda Island, as you can see there. And then you get in a boat and you take it around the far side of the uh, Lamu Island to the little town of 
Kaipungani, which is where we installed the water system, and we actually stayed at a resort just south of there, right near the, the tip. So we were almost within um, sight of the Indian Ocean from our, uh, from our uh, accommodations. It took about maybe half an hour, 45 minutes uh, by boat ride to, uh, to get our uh, location there. And that's the, the primary mode of transportation because the island is, is pretty swampy, not many roads and not many vehicles. And as you can see here, this is the kind of boat we, we traveled in. And uh, getting from one place to another can be a little tricky because you're you've got to sometimes wade in in uh, in salt water uh, for a few feet to get to get to the beach to get to your your place with your luggage and in, in hand. So it was not not always easy traveling um, around this island. But you can see pretty much the the uh, the channel there that goes around the island, the width of it relative to the size of the island. Uh, this was the existing or the existing water source on the Lam uh, on this little village in, on Lambu Island, just basically an open open well. Uh, it could easily be contaminated with um, human or animal waste, but they just basically drank out of this uh, this well. As a matter of fact, these girls were filling their water bottles when when I walked by, and this young man uh, was just taking a drink. Uh, but this is the new system that we installed uh, on the island. And it's a, uh, uh, it's a Sunspring system uh, developed by a guy in Colorado. And uh, they had done a lot of the preparation work as far as putting in a pad for us and dig digging the well and, <coughs> excuse me, building the building before we got there. So it was just a matter of installing the, the system. So the Sunspring um, produces or can, can filter about 5,000 gallons per day. So you need to have a, a good sized village to, uh, to accommodate it. And it's a fairly expensive piece of equipment. It's about $20,000, which uh, the money is raised through rotary donations uh, to buy the equipment. Uh, but 5,000 gallons per day, you need to have a fairly good sized village to support that. Uh, a microbiological purification uh, through a system, I think it was generated or created by, uh, by uh, General Electric, uh, is part of the system. It d does back flush um, four times a day, so it's a fairly uh, fairly low maintenance. Uh, it is uh, solar and wind powered, so it's it's it, it doesn't take much to uh, you can put it in almost any location where there's at least uh, access to those uh, uh, environmental uh, situations. And once again, as I said, it's uh, very low maintenance. It does have some things that need to be attended to, but through email or or the internet. Uh, the local people that are trained to, to take care of it can uh, can access uh, uh, questions on how to operate the, the machinery. So this this is kind of an overall view of the uh, the installation. Um, the the actual well is off to the left of that white building, about forty foot deep well that they drilled. It's uh, the water is then pumped into that tank on top of the building, and then it's fed by gravity into the for purification and then back into that building it is, is it is bought uh, for either consumption by the local uh, villagers or for um, uh, uh, purchase by other villages nearby. Uh, Umra Omar is a, uh, a woman, the local woman that was kind of the, the, uh, the lead person for our group. Um, she and her husband um, have sponsored quite a few things in the area to help help the local community. Uh, she's also the, the founder of a group called Safari Doctors, and those people go out into remote locations to provide medical services to little villages that don't have any access to uh, medical facilities or services of any kind. Uh, so both she and her husband are very active in, in getting these kinds of programs uh, off the ground. Another picture of Umra at the, the little uh, ceremony. <clears throat> so this is uh, this is the first bottle of water that came out of our system after it was installed. Uh, John Kaufman there on the left is the uh, founder of uh, H2 Open Doors and a Rotarian from the Peninsula Sunrise Club. And they uh, they decided to, to bottle the water in these two gallon jugs because they're fairly uh, easy to, to carry. They're not as big as the five gallon and uh, just makes a, a much better uh, 
uh, way of, of, uh, of delivering the, the water to the local villages or to other villages nearby. Uh, once again, the group, um, after the installation, the guy there with the, the one in the kind of in the middle with the that's petting the, the the donkey is Jack Barker. He's the the guy that uh, created and invented the um, the SunSpring system out of in Colorado, and he he pretty much comes on most of the trips to uh, help with the installation. We also did another project in the in the little village that uh, was. Uh, planting uh, installing a garden for planting vegetables for the local children. They don't get many vegetables on this island because the soil is, is so bad they can't really grow grow too many. So what they did was they, uh, and this was before we got there, they built this enclosure uh, to keep the animals and birds out and then brought in topsoil from a, from another island for these, um, these potting beds to, to grow uh, vegetables. So we helped them Build the soil and showed them how to plant the seeds and and um, and then uh, they'll have vegetables throughout the year as they kind of rotate the different crops. And here's uh, some of the kids getting the seeds to to plant in the garden. Uh, just a picture of the uh, the children and the and the the adults there in the village uh, having a having a local meeting at the school. The woman on the on the right is the um, is the superintendent for the local school there. Uh, this is a just a typical classroom in, in one of the schools. Um, they, they're, they're, um, I think they're fairly well educated. They seem to work on the basics of math and, and uh, English and science and so forth. So they, uh, they, they get it all covered. Once again, this is the, uh, the superintendent of the school there. And they all have cell phones, <laughs> even the little ones. Uh, it's kind of funny, kind of funny to see even the like the goat herders out in the the Maasai uh, area talking on a cell phone because that's their main mode of communication. So from uh, Lamu, we travel back to uh, Nairobi, and then over to uh, Tanzania. We drew, flew into uh, Mwanza, which is on Lake Victoria, and then drove down a couple hours to uh, the town of Shinyanga. And then from Shinyanga, we drove several more hours out into uh, a remote area for a, a festival called Saba Fest. And it's basically a cultural um, and, and a harvest festival that incorporates about 50 some tribes in, in the area. And it was quite interesting. Um, the gentleman there with the, with the lion hat on is the is the chief chief edward uh he inherited the chiefdom from his father who got it from his father and his father uh goes back several generations <clears throat> but um he uh, he's the one that invited us to be the special guests at this uh, festival and there reportedly were about seventy thousand people at this festival out in the middle of nowhere so it was, it was quite a quite a big event here's the uh, chief uh uh, paying homage to his uh, his great grandfather, who was the first chieftain of the of the tribe. They had lots of different cultural uh, things going on. Each each tribe would put on a presentation, cultural presentation. So uh, they were they're pretty diverse and and very artistic. Um, they had dancers and they had snake uh, snake handlers, uh, pythons. Uh, the guys on the right were uh, called herders, and they had quite a quite a display. Very athletic, and they just uh, basically danced to the the beat of a chant. Um, the guy on the left is actually in a in a pile of of acacia thorns, and these thorns are about inch and a half long, and they're sharp as needles. But he climbed in there to show how brave he was. And then the guy on the right is, uh, of course, got a snake python wrapped around him. And some of the women uh, showing their their wares, or the woman on the right has got a sugar cane on her head. That's the main uh, the kind of candy that they they chew on quite often. Here is uh, and uh, John uh, being recognized for their work with the water project in that location by the uh, the uh, the chief and his assistant. Now this is a, another water uh, project that they put in that location uh, back in October of last year. 
very similar to the one that we installed uh, in Lamu, but this one was up and running. And once again, they built this building for the bottling and then um, there's a well off to the off to the left that they're pumping water out of uh, for the uh, sunspring. This is the bottling uh, equipment inside the building there for uh, for uh, bottling the water to then to sell to local uh, communities. So the last uh, place on our on our the last venue on our trip was in the uh, Masai Mara, which is uh, the north end of the Serengeti. In, uh, but it's in completely in uh, Kenya. So we flew back to Nairobi from, uh, from Tanzania and then and to the, then to the Masai Mara for the last part of the trip. And there's two things in the, in the Mara that are of in interest, of course, and one is the wildlife, which is just amazing, but also the uh, Masai people that are very colorful and, and entertaining, um, very uh, unique uh, life, lifestyle. So within the, uh, the animal world, uh, they have what they call the big five animals, and they're the lions, the elephants, leopards, buffalo, and the rhinos. And the reason I have the rhinos starred is that we did not see any rhinos. They're very rare, uh, especially in this part of the Serengeti, and uh, we did not uh, get a chance to see those, but we did see every, everything else. Um, you have the, uh, the Cape buffalo there and a, and a leopard. and then. Beyond the big five, you have the big nine, which also includes giraffes, the hippos, cheetahs, and uh, zebras. And we got to see all of those animals. Uh, but there's a lot of other animals in the bar. I think I counted 25 or so different species of, of animals and birds that we saw. And they're just all over the place. Very prolific uh, populations of these animals. So you got the wildebeest, uh, gazelles, the topi, the warthogs, uh, impalas, baboons, uh, the elons. We even had one really tame one that just walked right up to our vehicles there in the little town. And it just kind of just stood there and, and let it just almost pet it. I'm not sure what the situ situation was, but uh, it was very, very tame. Uh, Dick Dick, which is the smallest antelope. Uh, birds, ostrich and uh, crown cranes, uh, guinea fowl and monkeys. And then for the, uh, for the Maasai people, we were invited into one of their little villages, which is in completely um, enclosed by a thicket of, of brush to keep the, the wild animals out. And there's just a little small opening to get in during the day. And at night, they bring the animals inside the village, and they would be basically where these, these, these men are, are performing, but they would bring them in at night to protect them from the animals and then close off the enclosures. Uh, but they did put on a presentation of their dancing where they jump up in the air and, and, and shout. You've probably seen that in videos uh, many times. This is their typical uh, uh, house. It's about the size of a two-car garage, maybe uh, two or three rooms with maybe one window, one door, and they do cook inside, so I'm not sure how well it ventilates, but uh, that's, how they, that's how they live. And about every 10 years, they have to move the village because the amount of manure in the, in the middle that's built up from all the animals is so thick that they need to then move the village to a new location. Uh, this is one of, the, one of the families. Now, they are polygamous, so uh, this is Stephen and his, his first wife and their two kids. And they live in one house, and then Stephen has a second wife that has one child, and they have another house nearby. And supposedly all the wives get along well with each other, so uh, it seems to, seems to work for them. And once again, they uh, performed numerous uh, dances and chants uh, for us while we were there. Uh, just some shots. Uh, I took along the way. This is a, a morning sunrise shot taken actually from a through the dirty windows of a moving bus uh, as we're driving back to uh, the airport, and that's uh, one of the uh, the, the ubiquitous uh, baobab trees there on the on the right. 
and then this is a, uh, a sunset picture uh, taken at the uh, the hippo, what I call the hippo pond, where the hippos spend most of their day underwater, and just sometimes just their snouts are out of out of the water, and then they only come out at night uh, to feed. Uh, this is a Milky Way shot that I took from one of the um, the camps that we stayed at the Leopard Hill and um, crystal crystal clear night, uh, no light pollution, so I was able to get a pretty good night shot there. And then I just included some more. Um, just for fun, this is the hand of an old woman at the Saba Fest. Uh, three lion cubs um, uh, trying to eat a turtle, which wasn't very successful. Uh, some of the people from the Lamu village. Uh, this was actually a, a scene from my tent at, at Leopard Hill using a very long lens, but I, it still you could see it from, uh, from the deck of my tent. Uh, a woman sitting on some sugar cane at the Saba festival. Uh, some more animal, animal pictures. One of the dances that they put on at uh, Lamu Island, the women uh, did a little fundraiser for their, their village. And different weather conditions um, while we were there. Got a, a big brainstorm one night in Lamu, but it really came down pretty hard. Uh, some of the villagers in, um, in the Maasai village, woman on the left and Stephen on the right. And the donkeys are very popular modes of transportation and carrying things around on, on the island. Uh, a few more of the uh, performers at the, the Saba Fest. And then another uh, night scene that uh, this was taken on Lamu Island looking out, out over the uh, Indian Ocean, right? Just kind of an opening in the storm. I was able to get this shot um, before it closed up again. And uh, final, uh, one of my favorite uh, animal shots, uh, Tiger by the Tail. <laughs> Um, that uh, kind of ends the program. But uh, I do have more pictures, and I think we'll in be including these links in the, uh, in the program down below um, of uh, uh, pictures from each venue uh, if you want, want to see more of my pictures from, from the trip. So with that, um, I'll uh, stop the sharing and we can ask some questions. That was extremely interesting, Keith. Thank you very, very much. I would um, invite the two participants uh, that have joined, two members from the club who have uh, joined us this evening um, to ask Keith any questions that they may have. Um, who would like to go first? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies first. <laughs> yeah, I win. Uh, okay, go ahead. Uh, um, hi, Keith. Oh, my goodness. Your presentation was incredible. Um, what you. an amazing opportunity to be able to go and do that. I'm like, and you're, of course, your photos. Like, um, you're just clicking through the photos. I'm like, please, more. I want to see more. <laughs> so I'm definitely going to be taking a look at your, at your accounts to see all those pictures. Um, but I think one of my, one of my questions is, um, uh, how did you transport that water system? It looks incredibly big and heavy. And so, you know, and you said you were going on boat. So how did, how was the transportation like? Well, I, I actually asked that question myself. Um, and, um, the answer that I got, and I'm not sure it's a credible answer, but the answer is that, uh, the, the people there, uh, I think they just all jump in and, and like maybe 10 guys will just. So they'll take it on a boat down to the down to the beach, and then they'll just pick it up and carry it for a quarter of a mile. Wow. Well, the other the only other thing that I could that I thought that they might have done is brought it in by helicopter, which would have made a lot more sense. But I'm not sure they have the have the finances to do that. But apparently, they just they just muscle it in there. So that, that kind of surprised me too, because the the crate that that thing came in was was pretty good pretty good size. Yeah. So, so just to clarify, so did you all bring that from the States over there or was it shipped independently? How did that work? Yes, it was already there when we got there. It was shipped independently. Yes. Got it, got it. 
So that was all arranged and it was actually pretty easy. It only took them about maybe four hours to actually set the equipment up, but everything else was all ready to go. And, and I think they in, indicated that, that this was one of the, the quickest and easiest installations that they've done. I think they've done maybe 23, 24 now around the world. Yeah. So this was my second trip with them, um, but this was what they said was one of the easiest. So, yeah. That's awesome. Getting that equipment in there would have been would have been a challenge. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. That yeah, I was. Just, I mean, the whole the whole time my mind was like, how did you get that huge thing all the way there when you were on tiny little boats? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks. Yep. Okay, Rashton. So I have two questions. Uh, first, the the. Uh, the I remember a program, and I can't remember whether it was from from this club or from Keith, our previous club. Uh, about H2 open doors, and they talked about how the the water systems also become a source of revenue for the village, where where they they turn around and allow others to come in and to fill up water, and, and the, the pricing is such that it it supports things in the village as as well as being reasonable to others. Is that something they talked about on the trip? That's the first question. Oh, abso absolutely, and that's one thing that John Kaufman is is kind of promoting is using this as an as an income source. For the village to generate income to help you know them you know create more wealth so it is definitely something that they're they're working on so there are some logistic problems or some political issues with that but that is basically one of the things that they're trying to get them to do is to use it as a revenue source yes it's cool um i, I could ask about 10 more questions on that front but i also wanted to, to just echo Verheen. i am so Inspired by your photography, I, I I'm, I'm I love seeing the different things that you put out there, uh, and you know the the stuff that I put on Instagram is, is kind of like a, a wannabe Keith Marsh kind of thing. Um, <laughs> those, uh, when you think about those those two shots, you know your your sky shots. How long did you have to leave the the the? I, I I'm not even sure I'm using the terms right. The exposure. How how long did the exposure need to be for you to be able to capture the the night sky like that? Okay, and actually that's kind of my specialty is the astrophotography that I actually did a program on for the club here, oh, maybe a couple of years ago. And for those two exposures, um, and I, I just happened to buy a, a new camera for this trip that is a little more advanced than what I was using before. But for those, those two exposures, uh, basically it's a 15 second exposure at 6400 ISO. But you have to make sure the camera's got to be wide open. It's got to be on a tripod and so forth. So the only challenge, uh, the one in Lamu Island, the only challenge was I got to put the tripod in, in on a sandbar and make sure it was really stable. But the one in the Maasai, I was out in the middle of the, of, of the not the jungle, but of the, in the meadow. And they don't want you out there at night <laughs> because the animals you know, can be a problem. So matter of fact, they have an, arm, an armed Maasai warrior guarding each tent at night. And just in case you, you come out, that they will, you know, protect you against anything that might be around. And matter of fact, one night, I mean, I was hearing lions and elephants growling all night long. So they're, they're around. But uh, I don't think they would have been too happy that I was out there photographing at, at 11 o'clock at night. But I had to get the shot. So. <laughs> Yeah. There must have been quite a bit of prep work that was done by an advanced team before you, uh, you arrived. Um, what was the, um, the, the nature of the, um, of the team that went before you to do the prep work? Well, that's a, that's a very good question. And I think most of the prep work was done by the woman there, Umra Omar, that I showed you a picture of, she and, her, she and her husband, I think, are fairly well off. Um, and I think they, they have sponsored a lot of these things themselves uh, and paid out of pocket. But I think they, they arranged to have all of that prep work done, have the, the, the well was drilled, the building was built, the tank, the storage tank was all there when we got there. It wasn't, it wasn't something that, that we sent some people in to do. It was something that the local people did. And I think it was through her efforts that that was done. Now, I'm, I may be mistaken, but that was. If one of the members of our club 
wish to go on uh, that prior, that uh, trip that you've just gone on, what would they have to do in terms of um, who would they contact or what would they have to do to become a part of that uh, program? Well, that's, that's another good question. Um, and it, there are several trips a year that John Kaufman puts on. Matter of fact, he's got two of them coming up uh, that you can sign up for. Uh, and there's no restriction on who goes, just, you know, you pay your, your, your price to, to, to go. Um, but if you go to h2opendoors.org, uh, he has a website that would, would list the, the upcoming trips that are going. He's got one going to Cuba, and he's got one going to India for both a water project and for polio. I think that's maybe in October. But if you go on his website, h2opendoors.org, I believe, it would list those those programs, and if you get on his mailing list, then he will let you know when he has uh, future trips coming up. That's how I learned about it. Okay. Um, is, are there any further questions? <laughs> One of the I mean, things I have so many questions, but I'll <laughs> just take <laughs> <through> time. <laughs> One of the things that I was hoping that would come out of uh, this program is to jumpstart our own club, International Service Committee. It has met once so far, and it's looking for members. And um, I hope that uh, people within the club who that are interested in international service would contact Angie, and the best way to do that at this point in time is to write to the president at um, siliconvalleyrotary.com, and Andrew will then forward on to Angie any of those members who would like to become uh, a member of that committee. Now, one of the things that uh, relating to that committee, which is, I feel, which is very important, is that uh, to first start a committee like that within a club, it needs to be what I call jump started. And that is what normally the problem is, is that with the, with the committee, what they normally do is they start to meet and the first thing they start talking about is fundraising. And the club then, uh, or the committee founders on this basis of what is going to happen with fundraising. And they never really get to the point of establishing a project. To jumpstart means that a number of individuals within the club uh, to, to start the committee donates, to say, 50 or or $100 to the committee for a project. Now, if the club raised $1,000, and uh, Andrew has said that he would be in favor of matching that $1,000 that was put up by the members, and then the effect of that would mean that with the district contribution and with the international contribution, you would erase that you would have approximately $4,600 to do a service project. The advantage of getting that started and jump starting it on that basis means that the committee then will focus on um, doing a partnership with some, something like Africa H2O and uh, be a part of an international project which we all could contribute to. So that in the future, if one of us wished to go on a, pro, um, uh, a program uh, with the, dealing with that program, we could. Now, as it is our normal cautious, uh, our, uh, our normal practice, Keith, before I ask you to um, give us a few words of um, 
advice um, in terms of the final thought, uh, I would remind all the members to um, not only to put in your comments in the um, discus section at the bottom of the meeting, but in addition to that, to register your attendance. And if you are a, visit a visitor from a different club, which you by filling in your correct email address, you will get back from our club secretary a receipt of attendance, which you can then put on to your club secretary. And Keith, I would like to ask you for your final word. Well, th thanks, Roger. Um, yeah, along this, the lines of this international service, um, I've had the opportunity to do several trips around the around the world over the my years in Rotary. I've been in Rotary now for I think thirty two. But uh, it's all I'm doing. The advantages are just com you know uh, complex uh, in the sense that. You're not only doing a rotary service project, but you're you're getting to visit you know countries and, and get involved in their culture and so forth. So there's a lot of advantages to rotary rotary service just beyond the rotary service. And so I would encourage people. There's a lot of programs out there through Rotary where you can you can travel and serve at the same time. So uh, think about that on your on your travels that you can incorporate you know some rotary service into your in, into your travel plans. So that's, uh, that's about all I, I can think of to add to that. Thank you very much for your presentation, Keith, and uh, um, everyone have a great day. Thanks, Roger. <laughs>